good to be here. It's good to be here and discuss the topic that we enjoy so much, spreading the word about how do you connect what you do to the business of your organization. That's what we're, we're doing here today. We've got some objectives that we have decided that we would focus on today. One is just reminder of the data sets that are possible coming out of our L&D area. And then reflect for a minute, what is it the top executives want to see? Uh, we studied those people, others have as well, and we've got a good, good grasp of what they want and what they need. And then how do you get there? It's not just tracking as you're discussing, but it's as, as Lisa and Crystal know quite well, it's you have to design for the result you want. And that's what the LCD model does is help you design for what you want to deliver at the end. So we'll be talking about that. And more specifically, thinking about how LCD can focus on um, delivering those results and capturing those results. And then, planning your next steps if you have them. It could be after today, you've got all you need, but if you want more, we've got some other opportunities to get some additional information. So those are our objectives very quickly. Some other resources, we'll send you a chapter uh, out of this book, it's ROI Basics, second edition, ATD. It, it basically covers what I'm covering today, the introduction to this. So that's one chapter. And then, you know, that's a, that's a book of about 250 pages. Here's a short version. You remember in, at the university, we had, to, we had to read a thick book, but we didn't want to read that book. So we go to the Cliff Notes or something like that. This is your Cliff Notes version. It's about 32 pages, ROI methodology and 12 easy steps. So we also have some case studies. We'd be happy to, to send this particular book with you to you if you'd like. It's so 25 case studies covering all kinds of um, L&D projects and programs. Studies including all the way to ROI and showing you marvelous, marvelous examples of how people have done this from the very beginning, um, even the onboarding all the way through um, leadership development. And you have the slides here, of course, for you as well. So those are things that you will get at the end, if you'd like, for your continued exposure to this process. I'd like to get, to get some information from you very quickly. Well, tell us if you think that these statements are mostly true or mostly false. So Andy's going to launch a poll here and we want you to select for each of these, is it mostly true, mostly false based on what you've seen, based on your experience? And to start with the first one, most learning and development is wasted. That means it's not actually used in the work setting. What do you think? Is that mostly true, mostly false? The second one, the learning outcome desired by executives is a rarely measured by us. That is, we rarely measure what the executives want to see. What do you think? Mostly true, mostly false. And then Learning providers, most learning providers do not have data that shows that we make a difference in the organization. To make a difference, we have to show that they're using the learning and it has a corresponding consequence. That's the impact. So what do you think? Mostly true, mostly false, that we do not have data that shows that we make a difference. How about the next one? Most executives view learning as a cost and not an investment. Is that mostly true, mostly false? What do you think? And then the last one, most executives view hard skills more valuable than soft skills. Now we know soft skills is a term that people use a lot, but it's not probably the best description. Some people call those the core skills or the power skills, but we know the difference here. Hard skills are more task oriented, job related oriented steps. It could be science, technology, mathematics, engineering, the STEM. It may be just steps on doing something technical, maybe hard skills. So what do you think? Mostly true, mostly false. Executives view hard skills more valuable. So now we've got some results. Let's see what we have here. Uh, mostly true for the first one. And 76%. 70, now, what we typically see is something 
close to that number at 80 plus is what we normally see. We, we've been running this poll for, for several years now with groups uh, in webinars and even in conference settings. So you can see vast majority says that's true. Now, that's pretty tough if you think about it. We're saying a lot of what we do is wasted and that's not a good thing, but we know it. That's the good thing. The fact that we know it helps so we can correct it. And number two is 95%. Um, Ooh, that hurts. It's like, we know what they want, but we're just not providing it to them. Why is that? Well, what keeps us from doing that? So we'll be discussing that. And then number three is uh, we don't have data that shows we make a difference. Uh, so 89%. Oh, see, imagine that. 89% of us saying we don't have data that shows we make a difference. Isn't that a little risky in an uncertain time? Yes. How about number four? Andy, what do you see there? We're at 82% true and 18% false. 82%. You know, we normally get a higher rating there. Right? It's usually around 95%. You see, we know what happens when executives see something as a cost. They want to pause it, freeze it, postpone it, reduce it, even eliminate it because it's a cost. If they think it's an investment that yields a return, hey, I might want to do more because after all, this is an investment. We've got to change that mindset. And you, you can imagine how we do that with some ROI calculations. Calculating the same way an executive is going to calculate the ROI of a capital expenditure. That's what you got to do. And you can do that. And then finally, the last one, Andy, what do we have there? We're at 84% true and 16% false. And yes. And, you know, we know, I think you know, that those power skills, those soft skills, really are more important. We think they are. And it's interesting because an executives will admit that what makes great organizations, the most admired organizations, the most innovative organizations, the most sustainable organizations, and the great places to work, all of that comes from soft skills, usually in the leadership, communications, team building, those kinds of things. So yet if they see Hard skills is more valuable. That means that we are already at a disadvantage because they, their, their impression is that they don't work, maybe. Uh, so we've got to work on this. So this, your profile is very similar to what we see with others. A little bit better, as we'd expect. Uh, but it, they point out some serious challenges for us. We've got to work on this. We, if we want that good executive support and that continued funding for what we do, maybe even more funding, We've got to really tackle some of these issues, and that's what we'll be doing today in our session. I want to go back to a study we did a few years ago. Uh, it was a study involving the Fortune 500 CEOs. Uh, we published the results of the study in a book that, that uh, Lisa held up. It's called Measuring for Success. The subtitle of the book is What CEOs Really Think About Learning Investments. And in, that, uh, in this study, it was hard to make this work, but we got 96 CEOs to give us eight minutes of their time on a paper-based survey and give us some data. And here's probably the most important one. Let's see, sorry. The most important one is, what are you measuring? And so we've got some things like inputs and efficiency. That's really, we, we put all of that in, in uh, the input category. And it's really how many people were involved in our programs, how long are they with us maybe, and how much does it cost? And those, you can see a, a lot of them are measuring that and they wanna see that. They wanna see who's involved, who, who are we touching, and also what we're spending on. It. But then when they get to reaction, now we got five levels of outcome that we will be discussing today. How they react, what they learn, uh, how they use it, they apply it, the impact it has, and yes, the ROI is the impact converted to money compared to the cost of the program. Now, we put those in front of them and see, we're asking this question. Is this something that you currently measure? They could either check yes or no. And we ask, should you measure in the future? Yes or no. 
And at the end of these, we had them to rank the importance of these, taking all eight of them and put them in the rank of what's important to them, number one, and eighth would be the least important. Now there's a number down here, it's award, that's an intangible, that's an impact that we're having not converted to money. Reminding ourselves that intangibles are very important. That's, that's the ones that we haven't converted to data because it was too difficult or it's not very credible if we did it. Now, as you look at this list, do you see some surprises? Do you, do you see some things that make you want to get depressed? You see, the, you know, we all measure reaction. Uh, over half of these executives see that data because we push it to them. But you can see they don't really want that so much. It, you see, from their perspective, they're not saying it's not important, but I don't really need to see that. They look at level one and two there, reaction and learning, more as an operational measure for us, for you, for us in the, as learning providers. But they get some interest here. It picks up here at level three. And then at level four, look at this. Almost all of them says, that's what I want to see. And that's our number one measure. But when asked, do you see this now? Only 8% said we see it now. Dropping down to ROI, about half of them see it now. But 74% of them would like to see ROI. So their top measures, number one and two, is the least measured here. So you can, you can see some problems here. We're not delivering what they want. Why not? Let's look at some issues here. As we talk about this, you've seen things change in learning and development, particularly for those of you who've been involved for some time now. So we're looking at how things have been in the past more to what we see these days in an emerging viewpoint. And the ones we checked here is what we're focusing on today. Uh, we're, we're trying to move from input focus to think on, that we've got to focus on those outcomes that are very important to the executives particularly, important to us as well. And we've got to start thinking about costs and say, this is an investment. And we've got to show our funders that what we do does make a difference. And it is an investment that yields a return, a positive return on that investment. And then we've worked a lot with science of learning. We got that down quite well. And so we need to focus maybe on learning analytics, looking beyond just what's happening in our learning assets necessarily, what's going beyond there. And then needs assessment is more about alignment these days. As we turn into a performance consultant, trying to connect what we do to the business in the beginning, aligning to the business. And then we, we measure reaction to learning. We know you do that all the time. It's time to move on and think of maybe application and impact and ROI, yes. So this is where we got to go. We got to go because it's needed by those who fund us for one thing, but it's really shows our contribution, shows we make a difference. And we all need to see that. So let's look at this, that dreaded ROI calculation that often frightens people is a simple term. Uh, here's the two ways we calculate it. We take the two most common uh, ROI calculations on the planet. One is called benefit cost ratio, and it's just the program benefits divided by the cost. It comes out of governments, it's been there for centuries. We try to trace it back to the second century AD when it was first used in governments. And it's still the way they look at, should we build a new bridge? Should we implement this new program, implement this new regulation? It's there. And then ROI is more of a business term. We see it, we see it in our own personal uh, wealth. When you put your money in a savings account, uh, you get a yield. That's the ROI of your savings. These days, it's only about 3%, but it's still a positive return. It is an investment that we're getting a return. That has its origins in business, and that still dates back about 400 years. So the point is, this is these are two measures that have been around for a long time. Now they've moved into our area. Our area is the non-capital. We early use of ROI 100 years ago was all 
capital investments, buildings and tools and equipment. Now it's moved to the non-capital. So that's where we are. So now what I'd like to do is to think about your own work here. Where are you with ROI? Another poll. What's your experience with it? No experience at all is one option. You can, by, by the way, select all. It's been suggested, but no action has been taken. I've attempted it. I've conducted an ROI study. And I wish ROI would go away. What do you think? Check any or all. Let's see where we are here. We just have one of you says that we, we wish it would go away. We understand that. Um, so, but a lot of you with no experience, it looks like the number one is that you've attempted it. So good, we've got, we've got a great group here. We do have some five people here, it looks like, have actually conducted ROI studies. That's good. Uh, please share your, some of your experiences with the audience in the chat here as we go through this presentation. Um, and maybe chime in with us when we get to our Q&A, if we could. So it's something we really haven't embraced that much, I think is what we're saying. And so let's look at some possibilities here as we look at how we can tackle this. First, to get to where we need to be, we're going to need to design for the results that we want. Uh, we know if you never thought about it, and you go evaluate and look for ROI, you probably won't have it. Same is true for impact. Of course, ROI comes from the impact. Those two kind of go together. You get your ROI values, the monetary values from that impact. If you hadn't planned for impact, you probably won't have impact. That's the, the, the dis disappointment here. So we've got to design for it. And you're set up properly here with this model. And, and as Lisa points out, we're gonna do more tracking here to see how well you're designing to deliver business value, deliver that value. And here's our model that we've worked with. This model has had its beginnings in the 70s at, at a place not very far from where Crystal is based there in Atlanta. Um, and so we started doing uh, first studies. The first study was at the request of a senior executive, the top executive. And we started doing more of those and we kept working with it. We wrote our, the first book of, on training evaluation in the USA, 1983. Most of you were not even born then. Uh, that became the first book. Kirkpatrick wrote his first book um, 11 years later in 1994. Um, so we got started with this a long time ago and kept working with it and making it better. That first book, incidentally, uh, it has an interesting title. It's so exciting. It just makes you want to grab it and read it on a cold night. Handbook of Training Evaluation and Measurement Methods. Isn't that exciting? Just makes you want to grab it and go. Um, well, that's, that's now in its fourth edition. It's principally a graduate text, uh, but it's still around. But we've added a lot to that in publications. It is a model that now enjoys the, uh, the most used label. By using, it means that we've actually got people use it. We can count 6,000 people who are certified ROI professional, actually over that, almost 7,000 now. That means that they've actually conducted the study all the way to ROI. Um, the Kirkpatrick's have 1,500 is that what they can count for doing a study uh, from their process. That's their silver um, bronze, I mean, silver um, designation. The goal is when you agree to get it published, and that's only uh, 300, I think, is their last count. So my point is this thing is used a lot. It's used a lot because we make it user-friendly, CEO and CFO friendly, but also research friendly. So it starts here with why. We, to have results at the end, we want to begin with that. So we say your program really is to start with why we're doing that, and that's a business measure. Why are we doing this program? It's a good question to ask for any of our new programs. And we'd like to say, let's connect it to the business in the beginning. But then let's make sure that we have the right solution. See, sometimes, as you know, it may not be a learning solution is the right solution. But whatever the solution is, there's a learning component to it, always. Or it may be it's the solution is the answer, but 
what kind of learning solution makes a difference. So we just want to make sure that, that what we're doing here can actually move the business measure. Then we expect success. Mm -hmm. Expect success means that we define for the entire group where is success, where does it occur? It doesn't occur until there's impact. And you could see it in that poll, we, that first poll we did. That's when we made a difference, application and impact. Impact. You see, executives quickly tell us just because someone learns, that doesn't mean that it's successful yet. It's a step, but it's not the end that we need. If they don't use what they've learned, and most of you said that that's a problem for us, it's a waste. And if that, if that application doesn't turn into impact, that means they're just busy. You can see executives want impact. And we really want impact. And those who support us want impact. The participants want impact. So we got to get there. And so we'd make that definition and proclamation. But then we have objectives for reaction and learning and application and impact to get to where we need to be. Given that to the whole team, designers and developers and participants and the facilitators if there's one involved and the managers of the learners and the owners of the program, everyone involved is sharing the, ch the challenge here to deliver that success. It's gonna take all of us to get there. And when we do, see these first three sets us up for success. We implement the program, then we make it matter. We, we, that has both a design perspective, make it matter to the people involved, and from a data collection perspective, we're going to capture the data there. That's not only capturing who's in the program, which we call level zero, but also our reaction and learning. And those two integrate with each other. And then we've got to make it stick. Again, designing for it, but then capturing it. Did they use it? Was there an impact? Tracking those numbers. That gets us the impact. If you think of it this way, very quickly. We start with a hypothesis here. Hey, this program is going to drive this business measure. These two steps are making sure we get there. We track the data and this measurement here says there's evidence we made a difference. But you need proof these days. You can't say we've had sales training and we, and we looked at the sales and they've increased 10%. So we're going to claim that. Uh, you'd be laughed out of the boardroom on that one because there's so many other things driving that. You got to sort out the effects of it. And that's what you see here. Make it credible by isolating the effects of the program. Then that gets us to impact. If we're going to stop at impact, we got to at least do that. But then if you want to go to ROI, this gets us to the most credible ROI, a most credible value here. That is, we want to make sure we're conservative in whatever number we use or whatever assumptions we're making here. And then we bring in the cost. The two go together to give you ROI. For To be credible with costs, we've got direct and indirect costs. To be credible with ROI, we're using the two most common ROI measures on the planet. And then we know there's some impacts that we have are very important is the intangibles. We're going to leave them um, there. They're going to be a data set separately. Uh, but we got to make sure they're connected to our program. So now I've got a story to tell. Storytelling is an important part of this. Storytelling. You've got six types of data, reaction, learning, application, impact, ROI, and intangibles. And you use the numbers and narratives. The stories will be the narratives you capture as they react, as they learn, as they apply, and as they have an impact. And then we use that to optimize the results. Make it better. Make it better next time. If it's negative and we want it to be positive, we improve it so it's positive. Optimizing. By optimizing, we stand a good chance of getting more funding. We call this black box thinking. This coming from the airlines um, as they take that black box after an airline crash determine what caused the crash and they use that to make changes so it doesn't happen again. So we want that kind of thinking, process improvement all the way through the process. So there you have it. We won't spend 
a lot of time on this. We will look at some key issues here. Um, now you're thinking, if I did this for every program, I'd be dead. And I would agree. You want to be very selective here. Here's our recommended percentages. If you've got a learning um, a department or function, and you've got maybe 100 programs, which wouldn't be unusual, uh, we'd say, hey, every one of them should be measured at reaction level, most of them at, at uh, learning. And we suggest about 30% of them pushed up to level three to make sure they're using it. That we could use sampling there even to make that more affordable. And then a third of those up to impact connected to the business there, you have to sort out the effects of your program on the data. And then half of those onto ROI. Now we do benchmarking with our users. We've got lots of users as I mentioned. Uh, our re most recent benchmarking, you can see the percentages. They're beating the, the recommended numbers. This is almost too high in my mind. We have to be careful that we don't create uh, paralysis by analysis here, by evaluating too much. You see, you know you've got some programs here that need, need to be evaluated at the impact level. It's usually the programs that are very expensive, programs that are very uh, strategic maybe. They're operational solutions. They're trying to solve a problem that exists or maybe take, take advantage of a huge opportunity we're facing in our organization. They're important and they attract the executive attention. You can see them. That's the ones that go to impact and ROI. So there you have it. Now, I just want to make a couple of points here. Starting with why means that we, we identify the business measure or measures we want to change. Uh, we think first, is it a problem we're solving or is it an opportunity we're pursuing? So it could be we got a problem now with turnover and we've got a program that we're implementing to, to solve that problem. Or it could be we don't have any sexual harassment complaints and we don't want any. We're putting a program in place to prevent it. See, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity to prevent that problem from occurring. But we work with specific measures. In those two cases, turnover and sexual harassment complaints. Those are the business measures. There are business measures out there everywhere. We're gonna always do that. Here's a way to see how alignment occurs. It's a handy way for, for visualize what's going on here. From any learning uh, asset that you want to value, evaluate, or cluster of assets, you are thinking, hey, this is the value chain that we just talked about. If I'm collecting data to see if I um, have this uh, successful here, I'm actually putting objectives in. The objectives to describe the kind of data I should be collecting, how much is needed for success, the minimum level of success. So the objectives drive the data that we need to collect here. But the objectives come from more needs assessment. And it really starts here. They align with these levels. The first one is payoff need. Is there a need for this to be, to deliver more value than it's costing? More monetary value, you're preventing more costs than you're costing for the program. I'd say most executives would say, well, yes, who wouldn't want that? But sometimes they're okay with that, not having that requirement because they've got some intangibles that they want to solve. Or we've got a compliance issue, or this is absolutely necessary for our business. We've got to do it. So my point is just thinking that usually gets us to say yes, and we set an ROI objective. But the payoff, visualizing the, the value of this program leads us quickly to the business need. That's the business need we want to start with, uh, defining those specific business measures. And then we, we take some steps to understand the what do we need to do different in our system to address, address that business need. That's our performance need. That's the solution. And it goes, to, that leads then to learning needs to learn what to do, how to, how to make that performance occur. And then we have preferences, how should we see this? You see all of those are translating right through the process over to the evaluation categories. So a program starts here, 
goes through our needs assessments at different levels now. And then we design, develop, and deliver that program and we measure success. So the beginning of the process. Here's our first three steps in our model. Start with why with the business need, make sure we have the right solution here and we have expect success with the executives. So that's a way to visualize this. Making sure it's the right solution often involves asking some questions, maybe doing a little of analysis to make sure we understand what do we need to do. You do that now in a lot of your needs assessment. So you're doing these kinds of things, maybe looking at records, having a discussion, referencing a case study, says, look, when you put this kind of program in place, you normally get this kind of improvement coming out of it. So we're using a series of steps here to just uh, make sure or at least validate in the minds of the people involved that yes, this is the right solution. Sometimes it's just having them to say, I think I can drive that business measure with this. That's maybe all you need, making sure you have the right solution. Expect success, that's the third step. That, that's the defining the success that we need, and that's impact, setting those objectives at multiple levels, and then giving those objectives to others. So we change in their responsibilities a little bit. Adding to that, say, we need you to help us design this program to deliver the success, and that is now impact, not just learning. I know a lot of you are in um, instructional system design, and we, when we say your, your work is not done, when you're, you've got learning coming through the program, for some of you that hurts. You said that's that should be what we do. That should be our success. But you can see from an executive perspective, if they don't use what you've learned, then you've wasted your time. So it forces us to really design beyond what's occurring in our learning asset. And you do that now. You just got to make sure it's working for us in the right way. And, and I know objectives is something that we both cherish and we uh, don't address as well as we need. And here's some rules. And this comes from three books here. Two of them are our books. And it's the third one that's, uh, to me, it's one of the best ones around. So called Measure of What Matters. Um, and so we're just reminding ourselves, objectives are minimum level of performance. Think about fewer objectives more than many. Help get subject matter experts to help set this. It's usually someone who understands the solution, the content, and someone understands the job where it's actually being used. That's helping us set the objectives, keeping them relevant. Um, use stretch objectives. People would like to go beyond the minimum. Hey, let's work that in our program. Stretch those, those people. But let's move down to number eight. Let's, don't, let's make sure it's not a performance review recommendation there. And we can change. If we set a number, it just didn't work. We have to back up and rework it. To change as things change. And failure is okay. Remember, process improvement is the key. Uh, most objectives should be time bound. And I think the most important one is the last one there. It's used for the whole team now to design, develop, and implement, and of course, evaluate the program. Then we make it matter. Make it matter by making sure the people involved uh, see it as valuable to them. Relevance, important, and it's action oriented. I will do it. I'd recommend it to others. You know, that's the kind of action orientation we want. Make it matter. Then we make it stick. Moving it to level three and four. We're going to be collecting data here to see if we made it. But we're working off our objectives for level three and four. That gives the participant an indication of what you expected them to do and the impact of that when they do it. This is where we work with transfer of learning to the workplace, which is so critical and been a challenge for us. But we're making progress with that process still and we're designing for application getting them to make sure that they leave our learning asset and do something with that here's some data collection methods this is from our users telling us what to use and this gives you a variety you know we all know questionnaires and surveys that's still our dominant method but we we go check databases particular level four that's good 
action plans, building that into our process, maybe a performance contract. They're very close in their definitions, but we also do observations, tests, interviews, and focus groups. So we're changing a little bit of the dynamics of data collection. And then we make it credible. Now here's an interesting point. Um, these are, these are credibility is so critical here. We think we need, when we're presenting this, we're probably gonna have an executive audience. They're, they'll get this data. This is the data they love. You remember, impact and ROI. It's a number one and number two measure. We gotta make sure it's credible. Isolating the effects of the program, converting data to money, um, and identifying the intangibles, the cost, uh, calculating ROI. You saw those on the, the list earlier. I just wanna show what that looks like um, for complaints. Um, so this is a conflict resolution program. You're reducing complaints. You got a complaint, a value for a complaint. Um, that would be something out of the records that we would look for. And this is how many connected to our program. This is monthly. We want at least one year of data. ROI is an annual number. We're going to claim at least one year for short-term solution. That gives us 36 per year because of this program. You can see there's the monetary value and it's compared to the cost. The cost here for this program is there. Um, and you put those two together in those two formulas and you get these two numbers. 2.2 benefit cost ratio says for every dollar we invest, we get $2 in, in benefit. In, $2.20 in benefits. For ROI, it says for every dollar we invest, we get our dollar back plus another dollar 20. That's staying the same thing. That's the important point here. We're using the two most common metrics here, ROI numbers. One comes out of government, other one comes out of business, but they really mean the same thing. That's the critical thing. Then we tell the story to your audiences. We optimize the results to get where we need to be. It's just that easy, 12 easy steps. And when you do this, it makes a world of difference. We started doing it in the seventies and it's our own team that got excited about this and we do more of them. And we did, we would do them for, and got executives excited about it. They wanted to see more of it. Um, you can defend budgets. You can align your projects to the business, show the contribution, get that respect that we need, build our own team morale, improve support. We often don't have the support we need. And so we make it better too. That's process improvement. We think that's the number one reason to do this. These days, the number one reason we get involved in this is saving my budget, protecting my budget, approving my budget. Hey, and then get that seat at the table if we want that. And here's my advice before we go into some Q and A. Uh, when it comes to delivering results from your progress, uh, hope is not a strategy. Luck is not a factor. Doing nothing is not an option these days. Things have changed in particular in our accountability. Executives are clear with what they want. Change is inevitable, but the progress we make is optional for us. So we really have to do it. The worst thing we can do is to wait for an executive to ask for this. And we've heard so many people say, my executives have never asked for this, so I'm not going down this path. And we say, well, if you wait till they do, here's what happens to you. And we get to see this too often. And when the request comes, at first, it comes with a pretty short time frame. You can't say, well, I've got to go out and understand how this works, and, and we've got to try it a little bit, and we've got to make sure it's going to deliver. Give me, you know, give me about six months. No, no. They want something quickly if they've asked for it. So short timeline. The second thing is you're now defending. You're defensive. You want to be on the offense. You want to drive this. You want to drive your own bus here your evaluation bus. And third, ROI is now on their agenda. You wanna keep it on your agenda. You control this. The worst thing you can do is as an executive, how should I evaluate this program? They don't know, but they know what kind of data they like. So we gotta do something. Waiting for them to show up and ask that question 
is too late. So here's some resources that'll help you get there, as we just talked about in the beginning. We'd like to send 25 case studies, if you like, here in this book. Uh, that's from people who come through our certification. I want to talk about that in a minute. Um, this is, a, again, our AT the publication, second edition, opening chapter we'll send to you. And then our application guide is a short version of that. So there you have it. If you want to know more, we've given you about 40 minutes worth here. Uh, there's a one-day boot camp. Looks like that's ha just happened. We got one coming up in Spanish, but we got we keep these things going regularly. So that might be a way for you. But we've also teamed up with Lisa and Crystal on, on suggesting something here. A discount for this particular group here, discount to our certification. Certification involves a deep dive into this, learning how to do this, and actually doing an ROI study to become a certified ROI professional. It's got, uh, if it's in person, it's got a week of training, or if it's live virtual, it's equivalent. It's asynchronous as well, which is also the equivalent. Um, but it also has coaching involved so that we get you through to your study and a lot of tools and templates there. You can see the detail. And here's some detail here. We've got one plan, but it looks like we're getting hard time getting people to want to come back live virtual, but there's a lot of them planned. So let's go to some Q&A now. 